Welcome to the next part about the legendary Zeppelin LZ-127. Like we heard in the first part, the big advantage of the LZ-127 over previous Zeppelins was its better structure. It had a better aluminium alloy, a middle catwalk to reinforce, and large blaugas cells to run the engines with almost the same density as air, which stressed the structure far less than concentrated heavy fuel tanks. If you lined up all beams of the LZ-127 behind each other, they would cover a distance of 16 kilometers, or 10 miles. The shape was compromised by the too small hangar from World War I in Friedrichshafen, so it had a straight middle part and not the ideal aerodynamic shape. To still reduce drag, LZ-127 used a drag-optimized silver paint with aluminium particles which also reflect sunlight to avoid the gas cells from heating up. That would have increased their pressure and would have engaged the automatic pressure release valves. But of course, they wanted to release as little hydrogen as possible during the flight, so they wouldn't need to refuel so much of it. Another safety factor for Zeppelins was power. Power was important to fly through tricky weather conditions with heavy winds. And it was important to have enough power reserve if some of the five engines would fail. LZ-127 used the new optimized Maybach VL2 engine, which was based on the previous VL1 of LZ-126. The size stayed the same, but instead of 420 horsepower, the engine now developed 530 and was prepared to run on petrol and blaugas. Again, the engine was started with compressed air and could be reversed with different cams, so you could reverse the Zeppelin, even without a gearbox, and that was a big reliability advantage. Shifting camps was also done with compressed air. The engine was so popular that also the USA ordered Maybach VL2 engines for their airships Akron and Macon. And this was the last Maybach engine for a Zeppelin. There was also research within the Zeppelin company to use hydrogen to run the engines, but that would decrease lift while flying and there were no good experiences with hydrogen engines yet. Because of the greater length compared to LZ-126, the engine cars were positioned further back and again the fifth engine car was sitting in the center at the back and included the landing buffer. But for the LZ-127, they designed the lower part of the vertical fin with a buffer as well, for the first time. And you have auxiliary controls in the lower vertical fin as well. And now let's take a closer look at the cabin. The narrow entrance was on the right hand side. In contrast to the LZ-126, the electric kitchen was now moved to the front of the cabin. The radio station was opposite and hence most energy was needed at the front, which reduced cable lengths. Again, to avoid heavy cables through the whole ship, electric energy was generated by wind turbines either side of the cabin, which could be retracted for less drag, if not needed. They had a huge battery on board to buffer energy and also had a petrol emergency generator. The 140 watt radio station was the biggest in the world in an aircraft and was operated by three officers. It had two retractable one meter long antennas with traditional zeppelin shaped ballast weights at its ends. The station managed not just the radio communication over long distances and weather reports but also private telegram service for passengers. In front was a spacious navigation room, and in contrast to LZ-126, there were no steps to the cockpit as the lower structure had been optimized. And with that, all essential equipment was at the front, and the whole rear of the cabin could be used for passengers. Highlight was the large 25 square meter dining room for 20 passengers. Behind it were five cabins either side for two passengers each. It was possible to remove the wall between the first two cabins to create a bigger family cabin for four passengers. The rooms included a sofa, a table and a window. For the night the sofa turned into a bed and another bed could be pulled out from above. Also the interior decoration was quite extensive and they could have saved some more weight here but the Zeppelin company wanted to provide a luxury travel experience and so they used high quality materials and stylish furnishing. Behind the passenger cabins they positioned a bathroom and toilet for men on the left and bathroom and toilet for women on the right. At the very end were two simple cabins for the crew. 
So that is a big step forward from the train-like compartments of previous Zeppelins. In the structure of the compartments, we can see the compromises of LZ-127. It only had space for 20 passengers, where it could have had more if it was designed for passengers only. And if it was a cargo ship only, they wouldn't need passenger cabins. And also, it's too slow and has not enough cargo space for being a real post ship. So the result is a huge compromise. Cruising speed was 115 km per hour and it had an impressive range of 12,000 km. 200,000 people visited the factory in Friedrichshafen during its 21 months build time and it had its inauguration with Zeppelin's daughter on 8th of July 1928, the 19th birthday of Graf Zeppelin, hence the name Graf Zeppelin for the ship. And on 18th of September its impressive service life started. In addition to the standard service route, it did a number of impressive journeys. The first North America trip started just three weeks after, on 11th of October 1928. Because of a heavy storm, the skin of one rear rudder got damaged and brave men climbed to the back of the Zeppelin during the flight over the Atlantic Ocean and closed the hole with Zerbritz blankets. They reached Lakehurst near New York after 111 hours and 44 minutes and stayed for two weeks to repair the ship. On 1st of November they arrived back in Germany. In March 1929 they started to a trip to visit the Orient. They flew over Italy, Greece and beat the record for the deepest dive of a submarine. They did that by flying 70 meters above the Dead Sea, which at that time was 200 meters below sea level. In May 1929 they wanted to fly to North America again but had to turn around because material errors caused one crankshaft after another to break. They could still maneuver the ship with just one engine remaining and landed in France, installed spare engines and never had these issues again. In August 1929 they started to the most impressive journey, the trip around the world. They covered 49,618 kilometers in 35 days. Main sponsor of the trip was the American William Randolph Hearst and he wished for a start and finish point in the USA. So LZ-127 flew from Germany to Lakehurst near New York first to pick up the Americans and arrived there after 95 hours and 22 minutes. Here it could park next to its smaller brother the LZ-126, now ZR-3. On the 7th of August they flew back to Friedrichshafen in Germany, where they arrived on the 10th. On the 15th they flew further east. The target was to reach Tokyo without a stop. To be able to do that they had to stay on the straight line towards Tokyo and used the tailwind. And although Moscow invited them to fly over the city, they respectfully declined and stayed on their path. One of the reasons the Germans were so successful with the Zeppelins was that they always prioritized technology over anything else. And to be able to reach Tokyo they couldn't make a detour. On the way they flew over the Russian city Yatusk and dropped a floral wreath for the German prisoners of war who died in Russian camps. LZ-127 reached Tokyo in Japan after 101 hours and 49 minutes and a distance of 11,247 kilometers. Both were new records for civil aviation. For comparison, a ship needed 42 days for that trip. And we actually have to talk a bit more about the visit in Japan. Zeppelins could only visit places where they had large enough hangars they could use in case of a bad weather. As reparation for the First World War, Germany had to deliver one airship hangar to Japan. So in 1923 Germany had to disassemble the Zeppelin hangar in Jüterbock in Brandenburg near Berlin and shipped it to Japan. In Japan they built an own train track only to transport the hangar pieces to its final destination in Kazumigaura, north of Tokyo. They needed with 460 days three times longer to assemble the hangar again but partly also because they extended it. This hangar was originally designed for World War I Zeppelins and LZ-127 was a lot bigger than them, with double the gas volume. Only because of this extended German Zeppelin hangar from Jüterbock, it was possible to shelter LZ-127 in Japan and to visit the country. And they extended the hangar when LZ-127 wasn't even built, so that was no preparation for the visit. 
The Zeppelin company sent specialists to Japan via ship before LZ-127's arrival to train ground crew and to make the visit possible. Everything worked flawlessly and the visit was a huge success with a German Zeppelin in a German hangar in Japan. On the 23rd of August 1929 they started again and reached Los Angeles after 67 hours with stormy weather over the Pacific Ocean. They also gained back one day because they crossed the dateline. On 29th they reached Lakehurst again and here the American World Tour ended with 12 days of pure travel time. After another four days they reached Friedrichshafen in Germany again and here the German World Tour ended. 40,000 people welcomed Graf Zeppelin back home and the trip was a huge success. In May 1930 they flew to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil for the first time to prepare for future frequent connection flights. In April 1931 they flew over Egypt, visited Jerusalem and Tripoli. And in July 1931 they finally did the trip to the North Pole. When the Zeppelin company asked for donations years before they promised they would be able to explore the North Pole with the new ship and now they finally had to do it. They financed the trip by taking 50,000 letters and by selling special stamps of this North Pole exploration trip. Additionally, Zeppelin's CEO Agna was president of the Arctic Exploration Society, which contributed as well. And the publishing company Ulstein paid to get the exclusive rights to report about the trip. The Zeppelin company was very careful with this trip because they never sent a Zeppelin to Arctic climate before and others already failed. They removed all unnecessary equipment and tried to keep the trip as short as possible. In the end, they agreed on one week. Inside, they used paper plates instead of heavier china. Remember, there was no heating in the cabin as well. One cabin was used exclusively for measuring equipment and they also used a special camera underneath to explore. They analyzed the magnetic field, climate change and hoped to find land underneath the ice. From August 1931 until 1937 the LZ-127 provided a frequent connection between Germany and Rio de Janeiro, sometimes even Buenos Aires. It was by far the fastest connection and the only non-stop connection from Europe to South America. And of course it improved the shipping time of cargo and mail significantly. When LZ-127 was built it was the largest aircraft in the world. It covered 1.7 million kilometers without accident, crossed the Atlantic Ocean 140 times and transported 34,000 passengers and 78 tons of cargo across the world. Hugo Eckner became so popular in Germany that he was to become a candidate for the German presidency. But because he was outspoken against the Nazi regime he was blacklisted and sidelined. When Goebbels demanded to paint the Nazi flag all over the complete hull of the ship, Eckner intervened and only painted it small on the left hand side of the fin. The previous German flag in black, white, red was painted on the right hand side and when Eckner flew over Chicago he did a right turn over the city center to show the old German flag instead of the Nazi flag. So there was always tension between the Zeppelin company and the new German leadership. After the Hindenburg disaster in May 1937 LZ-127 was grounded, became a tourist attraction and was disassembled in 1940 to be no target or navigational waypoint during World War II. Graf Zeppelin was very popular around the world. Its journeys were used in board games and there was even a patent on the shape and the Zeppelin name. So I hope you enjoyed this look back in history and check out my other videos for more. See you at the next one.